right, open your Bible, if you will, to Galatians chapter 5 and find verses 22 and 23. If you're joining us, this is part three in a series we've been looking at on the fruit of the Spirit, and we're finally at the second to last fruit, gentleness or meekness. And so we've been using Jesus as our example. Jesus is the one that was meek and lowly in heart. And so we're going to look today at the, at the fruit of gentleness and the fruit of meekness and humility. In this way, we're going to look at a biblical figure who I call the poster child for pride, Nebuchadnezzar. So we're going to be looking in the book of Daniel as well, but I want us to do what we've been doing. Let's quote that verse together, everybody in unison. Are you ready? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And we're going to focus on that second to last fruit today. Pray with me again, if you will. Father, we thank you for your presence here. Thank you that you are good. Thank you, Lord, that you are faithful. Thank you, Lord, that you are never going to let us drop. You're never going to let us down. We may seem to be in that situation, but you'll never do that. You're a strong and mighty tower. And the righteous runs to it and is safe. And so we praise you for your goodness. We praise you for these fruits of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, and we ask that this fruit would be produced in us, all of these characteristics of you, Jesus, this week. Help us to understand better what it means to be meek and humble in our heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to look at Daniel, so if you would turn now in your Bible to Daniel chapters 2 through 4. I can't read all those verses, but I'm going to read some of those verses so that we can get an idea of this biblical character of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was a ru world ruler, and he has two dreams, one in chapter 2 and then one a little bit later on. And I'm just going to kind of tell you the story, but I'm going to have my Bible open as well. So you guys, are you at Daniel? Remember what happened to the children of Israel. They, they went into captivity because of their rebellion against the Lord. We're going to look at a couple of those verses in a minute. And Jeremiah prophesied that they would go into captivity. Ezra talks about it. We'll look at those two references. And the children of Israel refused to change their ways. A title that I have for this message is The Remedy for Pride. And let me just tell you at the offset what it is so that we won't do what they did. The remedy for pride is being humbled. It's not real rocket science, is it? If we go up, if we exalt ourselves, then God will bring us down. So the remedy for pride, and Nebuchadnezzar is, like I said, the one that exemplifies this in the Old Testament, but there are other people that do as well. Herod was one of those people. The Bible says that Herod gave an oration in the New Testament, and because he didn't give God the glory, God struck him, and all his intestines came out. Kind of gross to think about. There were other people that were proud. Pharaoh was proud. Pharaoh refused to let the children of Israel go. And God was hardening his heart, but Pharaoh also, the Bible says, hardened his heart. Pharaoh was a world ruler. And what did God do, not only to Pharaoh, but to Egypt? He humbled them, sent them ten plagues, and finally, Pharaoh said, you guys can go and sacrifice to your God. But what a cost. What a cost to be humbled that low. So we're going to look at Daniel. I've got my Bible open. I want you to look at Daniel chapter number 2. This is the setting for this story. In verse 1 it says, Now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. Ever had a dream like that? Ever had your sleep interrupted so that you can't sleep? Uh, some, I mentioned this to someone and they said, well, I always get up in the middle of the night to use the restroom. That's not 
uh, abnormal at all. But how many of you have a dream that troubles you and you can't go back to sleep? Or maybe it's a dream like I've had lately. I can't even figure it out. It doesn't even make any sense to me. But Nebuchadnezzar had an amazing dream, and his dream was of this huge statue that had a golden head, it had a silver chest, it had bronze, and it had iron, and then feet of iron and clay. And God was revealing to Nebuchadnezzar the next coming world dominion. Nebuchadnezzar was Babylonian, and then the Medo-Persians came, and then the Greeks came, and then the Romans came. And we really haven't had a world ruler in the sense of a dictator since that time. The Bible says there will be a revived Roman Empire one day. And God's plan will come to fruition. But in those verses, God says that, Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head of gold. You are that head. He was the biggest and highest ruler in the world at that time. So what does he do in chapter 3? Look in your Bible in chapter number 3. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits. So that's a foot and a half. So what would that be? Well, you can do the math. 60 is 60 and half of that is 30. So 90 feet tall, more or less. And he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And he got everybody together. It says in verse 2, I'm not going to read all those names there. And he dedicated that image, and he made everybody cry out and fall down before it. Look in verses 4 and 5. Whenever they heard the music, verse 5, the horn, the flute, the harp, they would fall down and worship that image. Now, is that not amazing that God would give him a dream, tell him that he was the head of gold, and then he would even lift himself up higher to make an image for everybody to worship. That's what pride does. Pride focuses on me. Pride focuses on my accomplishments. Nebuchadnezzar had not learned that God was in control. And we're going to look at that in our Bibles. Look in chapter 4 now. We're just doing a real quick overview. Nebuchadnezzar the king, this is verse 1, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. Look at the change in Nebuchadnezzar and how he views God. I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. Now there's a progression, and we're going to look in that. We're going to look at that. I want you to look at how Nebuchadnezzar's understanding of God changes. Look, in verse, look at this verse with me, Daniel 2.24. Go back in your Bible to Daniel 2.24. Do you remember what happened after he put up that image? You remember that God humbled him? Here's the first. This is Daniel 2.24. He is the God of gods, he is the Lord of kings, and he is the revealer of secrets. Because Daniel interpreted his dream. And so Nebuchadnezzar was not a believer in Jehovah God or Yahweh or the Most High God until Daniel interpreted his dream and showed him. Now think about this. He's a pagan king. He's not an Israelite. He's not someone that God has blessed in the sense of being one of his people like Israel was. But God gave him a tremendous responsibility and he may have given you that too. Wherever you are, in school, at work, at play, at home, on your job. You have tremendous responsibility because you're God's representative wherever you go. And Nebuchadnezzar was the king of the whole world. And Daniel, or his three friends rather, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, would not bow down to that image. You guys know the story. He threw them into the fiery furnace, and he saw them walking around, and their clothing was not even singed, and they didn't have the smell of smoke on them. And Nebuchadnezzar saw a fourth figure in that fire. You guys remember the story. And when they came out of the furnace, Nebuchadnezzar was amazed that there was nothing on them 
and the fire didn't hurt them. Look at the second one. This is in Daniel 3, 28 and 29. Here's what he says. Now God is the most high God. He's the highest God. He's higher than all the Babylonian gods. And he says, blessed be the God of. Some people are going to take that progression when you share with them. They're going to say, I see God working in your life. I want him to work in my life like he works in your life. There is no God, he says, who can deliver like this. His word was life and death. The law of the Medes and Persians couldn't be changed, and the law of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, could not be changed. But he saw God, as he calls him, the Most High God, overrule him. But Nebuchadnezzar is not humble yet, not by any means. Let's look at the next revelation that Nebuchadnezzar has. This is in chapter 4. Nebuchadnezzar has another dream, and in this dream, God is showing him how he's going to humble him and bring him down. And in chapter number 4, verse 2, he says, I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me, for me. Nebuchadnezzar now is looking at God not as somebody else's God, but as someone that's working on his behalf. That's an amazing progression of what happens. But still, after Daniel interprets his dream in chapter 4 and says, you are the one that's going to be made like that stump in the ground. The tree's going to be cut down. You're the tree and it's going to be cut down. Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom was so great that all the world was under his care and protection, so to speak, and his authority. But that all came toppling down. It was 12 months after Daniel interpreted that dream that Nebuchadnezzar was walking around on his porch, on his, the top of one of his houses. You guys, let's uh, look for that. Uh, this is in verse number 28. And 29. This is all getting, getting ready to talk about pride. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon, and the king spoke, saying, Here's his pride. Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? You see that, what he's saying? It's hard to know when our thanks to God and our praise of God and our acknowledging God turns to, hey, I'm the top dog here. And the Bible says, while the word was still in his, the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you, and they shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen, and seven times shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, and He gives it to whomever He pleases. Everybody that's in a position of authority in our world, including our president, he's a nationally known and world ruler, so to speak. Every world ruler was placed there by God for a purpose, and He's the one that gives it. He's the one that works through them. Nebuchadnezzar thought he was the one that had built great Babylon, the hanging gardens of Babylon, one of the wonders of the world. Jeremy and I talked about it in our podcast. I would encourage you to look at that. We're doing that on Wednesday. Let me encourage you to look at YouTube as well and on our website and anywhere else that you can and dig deeper that's what we're doing when we talk together and ask questions about this subject of pride because Eastwood and those that are visiting with us today, this is our answer. If we go down, God will bring us up. He will lift us up. And if we go up, he's going to bring us down. Nebuchadnezzar had to learn that the hard way. So I thought, how can we even identify with a world ruler like that? I thought, Gordon, don't use that. Pastor, don't use that verse. 
But isn't that precisely what we need? Isn't precisely what we have in common with Nebuchadnezzar, the tendency toward pride and self-exaltation? Yeah, it is. That's why we read in Philippians 2 that Jesus humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death on the cross. That's what we have to do. We have to humble ourselves or God will do what he did to Nebuchadnezzar. I know he's done it to me. I'm preaching to myself. He's humbled me. And I may not express it like Nebuchadnezzar did, strut around on the top of some high building, but I might say that in my heart. And so might you. Do you ever associate the things that are happening? Do I ever associate the things that are happening in my life that are taking me down to be God's hand and not the devil's hand? Nebuchadnezzar was in God's hand. Job was in God's hands. But God allowed the enemy to do what he did in Job's life. He allowed that to happen. But God's ultimately in control. And God allows that to happen. And at the end of Daniel chapter 14, or chapter 4, verse 17, look at that text. In order that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men. And he gives it to whomever he will. So everything we have is a gift from him. So I thought further, you're getting my thoughts. I thought, Lord, what is going on here? How do we do that? Look with me at Deuteronomy 8. Real quickly, let's look at that. This is another long passage. I'm just going to read a little bit of it. Actually, it was Jeremy that brought this up. But this is one of those passages that I really felt like God wanted us to look at. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Remember the children of Israel have got out of Egypt. And they've been given the law. And now, in chapter number 8, notice what the Bible says. Remember, verse 2, that the Lord your God led you all these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and to test you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Wow. Part of that process was a humbling process. And I guess now because I'm older, I have a tendency to look back and remember what God has done in my life. I remember the low points. I remember the high points. I remember coming to this church. I remember the first time I preached here. That was a real high point. I remember when we had our 50th anniversary here. That was a high point. I remember some low points. I remember some great things that God has done through this congregation. It's not us that's making it, ha it happen. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And it could be that God is doing the same thing with us that he did with the children of Israel. He wants to see what's in our hearts, but he wants us to see. Look at that verse again. He testing. He's humbling so that they would know what's in their heart. Now look with me. Verse 3. He humbled you and allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna which you did not know nor your fathers did not know that he might make you to know that man does not live by bread alone but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Your garments didn't get old. Your feet didn't swell for 40 years. Their shoes didn't get old, another verse says. How many of y'all have the same first pair of shoes? No, we, you know, our foot grows. But after your foot quit growing, you have the same shoes that you wore when you first got them. Can you imagine your shoes not wearing out for 40 years? That's a miracle, right? But you guys like to shop. So can we laugh a little bit? It's kind of serious here. I need more than one pair of shoes, Pastor. I like to shop. I know that. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the miracle of God and what he did with the children of Israel. That's why Jesus quoted that verse when he was tempted. Because he was humbled. He was in the wilderness. He didn't eat for 40 days. All that symbolism, all that parallel to the children of Israel. But where they failed in the wilderness, Jesus succeeded in the wilderness. Where Adam and Eve failed in a perfect paradise, a garden, a beautiful garden. They could eat anything they wanted. Adam and Eve failed, not Jesus. He's our 
Savior. He should be the one that goes free, but he died for our sins. He humbled himself. We have to follow his example of humility. And the Bible says in this same chapter that they did not heed the warning. They did not heed the warning. Here's what happens. Look at me at this progression. This is what happens. Number one, time passes. Time passes. Write this down in your note. Time passes. And those should be coming up for you here in a minute. Time passes. And we forget God. Secondly, our hearts are lifted up with pride. Our hearts are lifted up with pride. Write these down. Thirdly, we think we made our successes happen. We think we made our successes happen. That's what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. Is not this great Babylon that I have built for my honor, for my majesty? And as soon as he said that, it was gone. Those are the things that happened to the children of Israel. They were satisfied. They had plenty of food. They had pl- their vines produced. And their hearts grew cold toward God. And they thought it was their effort, their successes that did that. So here's my progression of thought. I went from Nebuchadnezzar to the children of Israel. Now I want you to go to some positive things. Is this inconsistent with our victory? Not at all. Look with me at Romans 8, verses 31 through 39. Romans 8. I don't want you to walk out of here saying, well, pastor, you make me really feel about one inch high. Do I have to beat myself? How do I do this? Look at verse beginning. What did I tell you? Verse 31. Look at 31. God has predestined us. He's called us. He's justified us. He's glorified us. And then Paul says, what should we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He'll never let you go. He'll never let you down. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things. Who can bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? You're not condemned this morning. You're humbling yourself before the Lord. It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, or persecution, famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword... As it is written, for your sakes we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Paul says that in another book. We despaired even of life. We had the sentence of death in ourselves. God was humbling them and teaching them, teaching Paul that he's never going to let you down. But he is going to bring you down because he works through humble people. He doesn't work through proud people. The slightest little bit of pride, he cannot tolerate. He cannot tolerate it. So he brings us down. But this is a victory shout. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm persuaded that neither death nor life, Paul was shipwrecked, threatened with death, nor angels nor principalities, he had a thorn in the flesh, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So I wanted you to know that the humbling is okay to be in conjunction with the victory that we have in Jesus. They're not separate. They're together. Paul was humbled. Jesus was humbled. Every major person that you read about. I'm rereading Hudson Taylor's Spiritual Secret. He was a missionary to China. Wonderful book. Hudson Taylor was one of the most godly men I've ever read about. He was humbled tremendously before the Lord. He didn't say, oh, the devil's after me. The devil's doing it. No, it was God forming his servant so that he could work through him mightily and God work through him mightily. God is still doing that in my life 
and in your life. He wants to conform us to the image of Christ, which is also in this chapter 8, but we can't read it. So Nebuchadnezzar is a picture for us of the highest level of pride that you could have. And he was humbled. Deuteronomy is a picture of the children of Israel being blessed by God, which we are, are we not? And what he did with them. And then Romans is a picture of what God does in our lives in spite of everything that we're going on. He'll never let us go. Nothing can separate us from his love. So pastor, what's the takeaway for me today? You know who Neb is, King Nebuchadnezzar. You know the stories. You know the children of Israel rebelled against their God and God humbled them. That's a picture of coming out of Egypt is a picture of us coming out of sin and into the promised land, into the promises of God that are ours. I want you to look at James. He boils it down to what I would call an invitation. I want you to look at James chapter 4. And we're just going to look at, this is our ministry time. This is our invitation. This is what I want to do. This is the way I want to be. This is a Christian congregation. James is Jesus' half-brother. A lot of what James says is really to the point. And here's what he said to the believers about humility in verse number 13. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. That's humbling to read. Your life is like a vapor. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. Now, but now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Now, here's the context of that verse that we quote all the time for unbelievers. But this is to believers. Now, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Now, let me just break down the five things that they were saying. And I don't want to put any thoughts in your head, but the first thought that came to my mind was planning a vacation. And this is not saying that it's wrong to plan and have visions and dreams, but these are people that are planning without God. They're within the Christian congregation. They're, do they're doing life without calculating God in their equation. Here are the five things. The first one is today or tomorrow. That's the first thing that they said. You don't own today, and you don't own tomorrow, James is saying. This is extremely practical. We ought to teach our kids this, that God is in control of our todays and our tomorrows. Teach them this. Learn this. You're not in control of your life. I'm not in control totally of my life. I make decisions. But I don't have today, and I don't have tomorrow. I'm just a mist. Here's the second one he says. To such and such a city. To such and such a city. This is a general way of saying, I'm going to go here and I'm going to do what I have planned to do. This is where I'm going. I'm going to go on vacation tomorrow and I'm going to go here. And I'm going to look up all the stuff that I can look up and plan my life and my tomorrow no matter what happens, such and such a city. That's scary stuff to say. We do that all the time. We ought to teach our children, we ought to teach one another what we're going to learn in a minute. If the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. Such and such a city. Here's the third pride statement. Spend a year there. Oh, really? Spend a year there. You don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. You may not even be here tomorrow. That's a humbling statement. 
No, what do you mean, God? I can't plan. I can't go for it and do whatever I want to do. It's within me, and I've got the power, and I make the decision, and I can go, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this. We hear that all the time, and there's a point at which we leave God out of the equation. It's called positive thinking at its worst. It's called I'm in control of my life at its worst. Forgetting God. I've done this. You've done it too. Here's number four. Buy and sell. Buy and sell. Get a good job. Make a lot of money. Get a house. Get all the things that we say make us happy. And then lastly, make a profit make a profit. Those are the five things that people were saying in James' congregation. They they had forgotten that God was in control of all of that. We do that when we retire. We do that when we choose a job. We do that when we invest money. We say, here's what I'm going to do. And if I'm leaving God out of that equation and just being a good planner then I'm in deep trouble like these people in James was. That's our invitation to acknowledge God in everything that we do, to humble ourselves and say, maybe I'm not going to make it that long. How do I know I'm going to make it to the end of this message? And I don't want to say that in the scary sense of the word, but really that's true. I don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. Look again at that verse of Scripture with me. It's James 15 through 17. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. And I usually say that because of that verse. When I'm talking to someone and I'm planning or I'm saying this is what I'm going to do, if the Lord wills. Not in a feudalistic or a fatalistic sense or just to tack that on like in Jesus' name I pray but really recognizing that God's in control of my life in everything that I do. We're getting ready to start small groups next, next month, September the 16th. The groups are going to be different. Some will remain the same. You're going to have a lot more options to choose from. And we're asking God that He would be glorified in what we're planning to do even next month because we don't know what's going to happen next month. We really don't. So are you guys following me? Are you? The remedy for pride is to go down. It's the hardest thing for me to do, for us to do, for you to do. So we have an opportunity in this invitation to go down. And here are three suggestions to you or for you, for me. Recognize that we're temporary, at least in this earth suit that I have. We're going to get a glorified body. We're going to live forever. I know that. But time is not on my side. I don't have all the time in the world. I really don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. My future is God's future. My future is God's future. That's why in all of the lives of godly men and women, when they were assaulted for their faith, or when they were ridiculed for their faith, or when their character was maligned, They knew who they were in Jesus Christ, and they left the consequences like Jesus did to God himself. They didn't try to defend themselves. Their future was God's future. Secondly, as we have our invitation, why don't you guys stand with me as we get ready, kind of stretch our bodies a little bit. Secondly, I'm fragile. I'm, I'm a dirt clod, right? That sounds kind of funny. I'm made out of the dirt. My power comes from God. Everything that I have, my intellect, my ability to reason and think, my health, my two arms and not one, my ability to figure stuff out at my job, it all comes from God. He's working in us both the will and to do of His good pleasure. I'm fragile. A cold will tell us that. I had someone say, I've got allergies when they came in the building today. Can't breathe. You know, my back hurts. My leg hurts. My knee hurts. My hip hurts. All of that is to show us 
that we're not top dog. It's to humble us and then call out to him for healing. And then thirdly, I'm dependent. I'm dependent on him. My existence comes from him. All these are humbling thoughts. They're not welcome in our world. We don't talk about death and dying. We don't talk about the temporary ness of life. Bow your heads with me as we get ready for our time of ministry and also our time of invitation. Bow your heads with me. Father, I need help in this area. Your people need help in this area. Lord, help us to humble ourselves before you wherever we are in our walk with you. Let us be meek and humble in heart like Jesus was. Let us let you live your life through us this week. When we're challenged, let it fall on you. When we're disappointed, let us recognize that you have not let us go. In everything that we do, Lord, help us to come down. And then, Lord, we're, we're willing and we're ready to have you take us up. Let us have that attitude in us that was in Christ Jesus, that attitude of meekness and humility. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us now in this time of ministry. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.